This is Ray Mosholder. The article that I'm about to read was written by Ashark al Assad and was reprinted by Gatestone with the kind permission of the author. The author called it First Round to Putin. What next? Amr Tahiri, the author of this article, was the executive editor-in-chief of the Daily Kehan in Iran from 1972 to 1979. He's worked at or written for innumerable publications, published 11 books, and has been a columnist for Ashark al-Assad since 1987. He begins Initially aware that Russian President Vladimir Putin must cast himself as a victim in order to win sympathy in Western public opinion, sympathy that warms up to figures like Saddam Hussein or George Floyd, Putin presented Russia as a victim of NATO expansion and his saber-rattling as an act of self-defense. Under NATO rules a country that hasn't settled its doctrine and disputes with its neighbors and can't be admitted as a member. That rule applies both to Ukraine and Georgia, another country invaded by Putin both of which are barred from NATO membership because of their territorial disputes caused by Russian aggression. Thus Putin was making a song and dance about something that couldn't happen under NATO's own rules. Putin can no longer play a wolf disguised as a sheep even his apologists, not to say his mercenaries among Western politicians and journalists, aren't able to defend his latest move, let alone his presenting himself as the victim of imperialism. Putin would be wrong to think that with the passage of time, the rest of the world will endorse his conquest just as no one ever recognized the annexation of the Baltic republics by Stalin. The spectacle of ancient Russian tanks and armored vehicles creeping into Donbass showed how terribly old Putin's arsenal really is. At first glance, the latest twists and turns in the Ukraine poker game might make people think Russian President Vladimir Putin is the winner. After all, he's reaping what he sowed eight years ago when he incited ethnic Russian secessionists to set up the breakaway People's Republics in part of the Ukrainian territory in the next and Lugansk. By stationing troops in those two enclaves, Putin made official an occupation that he had indirectly exercised through Wagner mercenaries and local militias, imposing two cooperation treaties on the breakaway republics. He also showed in their annexation that they are owned by Russia. Never mind that NATO is a defensive pact and not allowed to attack anyone unless one of its own members is first attacked. Even then, Article 5, under which military action is allowed, is not automatically applicable and hasn't been applied since the alliance was created. In contrast, 
led by the now defunct Soviet Union, the rival Warsaw Pact was used for military interventions in Hungary, Poland, and Czechoslovakia to crush popular uprisings against Russian domination. Putin claimed that NATO plans to include Ukraine as a member and use it as an advance base against Russia. That claim shows that Putin sees a war between his Russia and NATO as a possibility, if not a probability, in the short run. That claim is hard to sustain, if only because, under NATO rules, a country that has unsettled iridescent disputes with its neighbors cannot be admitted as a member. That rule applies to both Ukraine and Georgia, another country invaded by Putin, both of which are barred from NATO membership because of their territorial disputes caused by Russian aggression. Thus Putin was making a song and dance about something that couldn't happen under NATO's own rules. In time, however, Putin may find out that he has scored a hollow victory at great political, economic, and even security cost. To start with, he can no longer play a wolf disguised as a sheep, revealing himself as an adversary, if not a mortal foe of the democratic world. Putin makes it easier for those in the West who have enough backbone to stand up against appeasers. Putin may find out that although Joe Biden may be weak in a pushover, the United States and a family of democratic nations aren't. Putin's call for the recognition of his two phantom republics is also likely to fail as did his similar calls for recognition of the annexation of Crimea in 2014 and the independence of Georgian territories of Abkhazia and South Ossetia in 2008. Even his stooges in Tehran have not dared recognize those acts of aggression as legitimate. His latest buddy, Turkey's Recep Tayyip Erdogan, has called it unacceptable, while big brother Xi Jinping in Beijing has drowned the issue under an avalanche of equivocal spit. That leaves Belarus's Mad Max, Alexander Lukashenko, who may or may not endorse Tsar Vladimir's latest naughty crack. Putin would be wrong to think that within the passage of time, the rest of the world will endorse his conquest, just as no one ever recognized the annexation of the Baltic Republics by Stalin. Putin is also wrong to think that forcing Finlandization on Ukraine could offer Russia the glacius he wants. In fact, Finland, the original model for Finlandization, has steadily strengthened links with Western democracies by becoming a member of the European Union and forging close ties of cooperation with NATO. It has also built a strong defense. Guess against whom? Recently, Finland bought 64 ultra-modern F-35 warplanes 
enough to knock out half of Russia's antiquated flying machines. Sweden, another non-NATO democracy, and thus regarded, regarded as Finlandized, has taken note of Putin's growing aggressive behavior and increased its defense expenditure and strengthened its military presence in Gotland archipelago. Since the Russian invasion of 2008, though barred from NATO membership, Georgia too has been rebuilding its military defenses, almost doubling the size of its army and acquiring modern hardware from the West. Thus, there's no reason why Ukraine, which cannot join NATO till it has settled territorial disputes with Russia, won't be able to upgrade its defenses with support from Western democracies, something that's already happening, albeit on as yet modest scale. Putin's aggressive behavior strengthens the hands of Ukrainian nationalists who seek a European future for their nation. In turn, that would justify more expenditure on Ukrainian defense, something that could force Putin into a mini arms race on Russia's western fringes. The spectacle of ancient Russian tanks and armored vehicles creeping into Donbass showed how terribly old Putin's arsenal is. Keeping 150,000 troops or 10% of his usable military capacity in Donbass can't be a realistic prospect at a time Putin has got Russia militarily involved in Belarus, Kazakhstan, Transcaucasia, Tagestan, Syria, Libya, Mali, and the Central African Republic. Empire building is also costly. Since 2014, Crimea deprived of its principal source of revenue, foreign tourism, has cost Russia some $40 billion, including the cost of a bridge to the mainland. With Donbass at point zero in terms of economic survival, Putin would have to cater for over 4 million new socially assisted people, including many old pensioners. Anyone following Russian politics with some interest might notice another fact that might expose Putin's victory as hollow. The absence of a large consensus on Tsar Vladimir's latest gamble in the televised show designed to show that Putin was acting on the advice of the highest officials, Prime Minister Mikhail Mikustin, and at least two other members of the National Security Council, sounded less enthusiastic about the course suggested by Putin and hinted that the diplomatic course might be blocked. The haste with which Putin pushed treaty texts through the Duma, the Russian parliament, also indicated concern that genuine debate might indicate lack of full support for the Donbass adventure. Those who see Putin as a potentate might dismiss that suggestion as fanciful and they could be right. Nevertheless, the possibility 
that some in the Russian leadership elite may be concerned that Putin's paranoia shouldn't be ruled out. This is a multi-round match and Putin may have won the first round. However, the final bell hasn't sounded yet and Ukraine's people are proving themselves an extremely fierce opponent.